Today we have with us uh, Chris Meyer in our risk management department. We're so happy she's here, really, really happy she's here. Chris is one of uh, the first COVID patients in Lincoln, happened to be one of our employees. She's gonna share her story and boy, it's great to have you back in the office. Chris. And then we have John uh, Woodrich, the Chief Executive Officer of Bryan Medical Center, share a little bit about what's going on inside the building. It's going to be a, a very busy day in both Lincoln and Crete from the early um, results from scheduled tests. So let's get right to our numbers. Uh, midnight census was 395 here at Bryan. Our Brian Easy visit questionnaires that have been completed have now eclipsed 11,000, 11,164 individuals, resulting in 3,559 easy visits and 1,670 have used the COVID promo code. In total, we have completed COVID-19 tests on 2,849 tests have been administered, resulting in 219 positives, meaning there were 2,372 that were negative and we have 179 that are pending. So with that, I'll turn it over to John. Thanks, Bob. John Woodrich, CEO of Bryan Medical Center. Uh, we have 11 uh, positive uh, COVID patients in house right now, five from Lancaster County, six from outside the county. Uh, three individuals are still on ventilators. We have four in our ICU unit, two in our progressive care unit, and seven in our uh, general care unit. Uh, we mentioned yesterday that we will be at Crete today from uh, 3.30 until, or from 6.30 until 9 p.m. Uh, we have 162 patients scheduled, so we're glad people are taking advantage of the service. We also, at our drive through today, have 130 individuals scheduled. So almost 300 people will get tested today just in those two locations. And we already have 90 people scheduled in our drive through for tomorrow. So we are looking currently at expanding the drive through capabilities. And we're working with the health department uh, at Crete to decide if we will do another mobile uh, site for later on this week, and I believe we will. Uh, the goal, as everybody knows, is we want to get people tested that have been screened and are showing these symptoms so that they could take the appropriate action either in self-isolation or self-quarantining and also so that their family members who they're living with understand that as well and we could continue to uh, stop this spread. I do want to just once again, as we continue with the mobile unit, let people know that you need to call in, and that number is 402-481-5121, and we will continue to uh, take care of folks and get them tested. Uh, we did talk the other day about our elective surgeries. We have communicated that out to our physicians, so they are starting to schedule elective surgeries and as we said in the past we are scheduling those surgeries that have no longer than a one day length of stay and we will do that for about a two week period of time and look at this from an assessment perspective to see how the volumes and how we're doing with that and handling the surge that's occurring and we'll make a determination if we'll expand that uh, in future weeks but we will take those really a day at a time and continue to make sure that we're keeping uh, people safe. That is our patients, our providers, and our staff. And uh, we'll just keep the, the media and everybody informed as we progress on that. Now I have the honor to ask Chris to come forward and share her story. Good morning. As John and Bob said, I'm Chris Meyer. I'm the Risk Management Officer here at Bryan Health. I've been with Brian for about five years and I've been a registered nurse for 27 years. I was asked to share my journey as one of the first um, to test positive for COVID-19 at Brian. As a nurse, I was concerned not only about my health and my family's health, but also for the people that I interacted with at work that would be depended upon in the coming months as the pandemic spread continue to grow. My sharing is not intended to induce fear, but to give a face that the impact of this virus has made on my life and on those around me. I presumably contracted 
this virus during travel to Nashville from March 12th through the 15th with my husband and two oldest children. Despite using copious amounts of hand sanitizer and, sanitizer and disinfecting wipes, on March 18th, I developed a fever of 101, along with a cough, headache, sore throat, body aches, and my influenza A and B were both negative, the respiratory pathogen pi panel was negative, and my chest x-ray was negative. So I was instructed to go home and self-isolate. The very few COVID-19 test kits at that time, I believe there were seven, were being um, rightfully um, distributed for patients that were hospitalized. I was able to get tested on day seven when Bryan Health opened their drive-through testing site. I received my first positive test result on day 13. By this time, my symptoms included severe fatigue, low-grade fevers, weakness, headache, lightheadedness, my heart rate went from 60 to 130 with just minimal activity along with shortness of breath, intermittent cough, and a lack of taste and smell. And I have never slept as much as I did during that time. Knowing that this virus usually lasts around 14 days, I was expecting that I'd be feeling better very soon. I received two rounds of, out of antibiotics orally <clears throat> just in case there was an underlying bacterial infection. <clears throat> on day 16, I ended up having about eight hours of euphoria where I felt wonderful and felt like this virus had finally left my body. So I started the process of getting back to work, which included two negative COVID-19 tests. I was tested on day 17 and 18, only to find out that I was still positive and definitely not feeling well. On day 20, I agreed to be hospitalized since my symptoms were not improving and to see if there was any underlying condition that could be treated. I spent a few days in the hospital receiving excellent care. They ran multiple tests and I was treated for a pre-existing anemia and was confirmed that all of my other symptoms were due to COVID. I was very fortunate that my lungs were not affected and that my pre-existing intermittent asthma was not exacerbated. On Easter Sunday, 26 days after my um, start of symptoms, I found myself in the emergency department with a very angry um, and painful blood clot in my arm, which I found out later is also linked to COVID. Fortunately, I was able to go home and treat it from home. I was finally experiencing decreasing symptoms later that week and tested negative for COVID-19 on day 31 and 34. I was able to leave my bedroom in self-isolation after 32 days and began the task of rebuilding my core strength and stamina, which has proven to be much more difficult than I expected. Five weeks after first developing symptoms, I was finally able to return to work, which was so wonderful to be on the road to recovery. Although I wish that I could say that I'm fully recovered, unfortunately, I can't. I'm still not able to work full days. I still have good days and bad days, and I'm not consistently getting better each day, which has been very frustrating. I was asked to address how I cared for myself being isolated for 32 days. And so I was very fortunate that I was able to work from home um, remotely as I was able to. And I was able to keep up on emails and the day-to-day -day changes that were happening around here, um, especially related to my work. Depending on how I was feeling, I read several books, watched a few shows, stayed current on the state of the world, corresponded with friends and family through phone and text and FaceTime as I was able. I did online games to try to keep my mind active to counteract my decreased mental clarity. My kids visited me, I was very fortunate. They visited me at my bedroom window um, most days and maintained about 10 to 12 feet of distance. They were quarantined to our house for the first 19 days of my illness. I really underestimated the impact that my illness would have on them. My husband kept me nourished and hydrated, knowing that that was an important part of the healing process. He was quarantined for the entire length of my illness since he was handling my dishes and coming into my bedroom to check on me and talk from a distance. 
I'm so grateful for the love and prayers and support that I received, especially knowing that there are so many people suffering greatly from social isolation, both physically and emotionally. I was very active, hardworking, and a healthy person prior to March 18th. With a healthcare background, I was fortunate to be able to tra travel, and for over a month, I was very sick. This virus doesn't discriminate based on race, gender, or age. I don't want anyone to have to go through what my family did or experience the heartache that other families have. If I can leave you with just a few suggestions, until we have a treatment or a vaccine, please practice excellent hand hygiene, social distancing, limiting and avoiding large crowds. Just be cautious and smart, not just for yourself, but for those who are unable to fight this virus. And check in on your friends and family and neighbors who are lonely and maybe struggling emotionally. To end on a positive note, through meticulous hand hygiene and respiratory hygiene and following the CDC guidelines for um, self-isolation and self-quarantine, I'm incredibly grateful that no one else in my family or those who I had contact with at work before my symptoms began, developed and became ill with the virus. That in itself has been a huge blessing. Thank you. Our drive-through right now, we're open a couple hours a day. We can go ahead and expand that to additional hours. And then that's the nice thing about the mobile uh, um, vehicle, we can go ahead and move that to any location uh, that we see a need. So we will continue to work with the health department. I talked to Pat today and uh, we're trying to identify some areas to move our uh, mobile unit to next. We will coordinate that in conjunction with what we're doing uh, at the Crete location. But I believe we have those capabilities uh, both mobile as well as at our current uh, drive through site. Well, quite honestly, when I found out I was positive, at least I had something to um, um, validate the symptoms that I was having. Um, the more scary part was when I wasn't positive and I felt so ill, not knowing what was going on and why my body was acting the way it was. And my biggest fear was honestly, who did I infect, um, not knowing that I was sick. So, um, so getting the positive diagnosis, um, was at least it gave me um, a name to what I was suffering with. So thank you. The mobile, we are capable of 160 a day and the drive through, we were doing about 110 a day, but we've eked above those today. We can increase just by increasing the hours. So we're going to do that based on the demand uh, that we're seeing from individuals. And then, of course, at the hospital, we're taking care of uh, any of our inpatients as well as uh, any staff and uh, first responders we're trying to uh, take care of as well that, that come to our facility. Um, we will just keep increasing as the demand uh, dictates to us. Uh, we have the capability of continuing to run tests in-house as well as sending them to outside labs. Um, right now, our outside lab has been doing a fabulous job for us, so uh, we will just continue doing testing. I think, you know, the sky's the limit, quite honestly, as to how many we can continue to do long as we uh, keep the tests coming in. And right now, we seem to be well-equipped uh, for doing our tests as well as for uh, resulting those both. But that can change as the demand continues to grow. And recall that the governor is setting up that test Nebraska, which we believe will still be in a few weeks, that I think their capability is to do two to 3,000 tests a day. No, but we haven't been asking. The community was so incredibly generous early on when the supply chain was really, really contracted, um, still is, but it, it's, it's easing some. So everything from gloves, uh, shields, masks, homemade masks, um, pappers, you name it, we covered them in past things, but nothing 
uh, recently because there hasn't been the need. And there's other frontline responders in town that, that need them more than, than us now that the supply chain has opened up some. I would like to once again thank the community because we could not have gotten through that gap period without you as, as this was ramping up on us. This virus uh, attacks people in different ways, and I think we've seen individuals that have had very mild cases of COVID to you see other individuals that are on a ventilator. So it's a wide degree uh, based on underlying symptoms of the individual of how quickly they recover um, and probably how much they were exposed during those periods of time and how long they stayed in those environments of exposure. So I think it varies based on the patient. Right now, we are still requiring a uh, physician order, but with some of these uh, areas that we're going to, um, we're working with those health departments where they're having an individual sign off on those orders so that uh, these individuals can call in. And, uh, and if they're stating they have those symptoms and they're screened appropriately, then we have a doctor that's signing that for, so that they can have the test completed. I'd say the biggest misconceptions are anyone who can get a test or wants a test can get one was one big one that uh, we were kind of approached by the public on uh, that only COVID-19 patients can go to the emergency department. Again, we've asked for your help and you've done a great job of getting that message out that if you are sick, please still come to the emergency department. We can separate and segregate uh, patients appropriately. Another misconception was there was enough PPE. So um, obviously from the question a few minutes ago, that was not the case early on. Some on vents. Uh, we brought to you in past ones hydroxychloroquine and, and what was going on there that it wasn't necessarily a remedy. There was research being done. As Dr. Johnson mentioned, it was uh, even lethal for some in, in the cardiac arena. Most recently, UV light and disinfectant that might help uh, if it's injected into your body. Believe it or not, you have people that ask questions on that when they hear it. And then I think the last one that has been somewhat dangerous to us is the insinuation that this disease spread is the fault of certain races or ethnicities, some about age, as Chris just showed you. Uh, it does not discriminate by, by race or gender. It's weird. It's been open, but certainly severely stymied. Um, as for the modeling of the Washington study, uh, there would probably be varied opinions even throughout Brian on that date. And there's other modeling that is slightly different. Um, in fact, one that I learned about through uh, the great reporting in town is uh, COVID19.healthdata.org. It's one that's being used widely in Nebraska, shows something a, a little bit different than what the Washington was there. So. You know, I don't know uh, where the best answer is on that. Um, and in kind of crisis management of a pandemic, there's a in initial phase, a maintenance phase, and then you get to the um, kind of the reflection and evaluation phase. And until we do that, we're not, not really going to know who was right, wrong, or what was inconclusive, but we will do that. I would say what we're all in total agreement with is this has been very difficult for families, for businesses, for savings accounts, for the food bank, for philanthropic giving, and whatever we can do to get back to some uh, semblance of normalcy, would be, we would all be in favor of. Um, until there's a treatment and a vaccine, I think uh, restrictions, as Chris uh, reiterated, on gatherings, um, elements of social distancing, being, you know, meticulous with your hand hygiene, even overzealous, um, and masking in certain cases would be the case. And from the governor to local officials, and Brian, I think we've all been on the same page for for that. So, so sorry, we don't have a specific opinion on the date. There's just a lot of information out there, and everyone's trying to make the the best decisions possible to get us back to normal. No, there is a screening element. I, and Brian's kind of taking a, a 3S approach to this. We're going to screen people, and that can be essentially asking the appropriate questions. A physician may then ask for a test, but there will be the initial screening questions like any surgical uh, 
um, you know, procedure. After you screen, we are going to separate uh, patients and staff accordingly with separate entrances uh, for separate, you know, needs. And then the third S is really safety. Uh, every decision made around elective surgeries will be safe, in our opinion, for patients, our physicians, and our, and our staff. I think it's within reason to think the Crete numbers are going to continue to grow. And that's not just Crete as well. Many uh, individuals that work down there actually are Lancaster County residents as well and commute back and forth.